Now let's look at the discussions on to the hypertension and the heart failure component. Let's look at the cardiac part now. So you have this patients with diabetes, hypertension should always be treated to keep a target blood pressure of 140 around 90, right? Uh, slightly lower than 140 by 90. And cardiovascular risk factors should be systematically assessed at least annually in all patients with diabetes. Now in an acute settings, you can target a blood pressure even lower around 140, 80. And in regular follow-up settings, if you have a, a, you know, a, a younger patient, you would target a blood pressure below 130, 80. And those patients who are above 65 or 70 years, you would want to target a blood pressure anywhere below 140 by 80. So those are the guidelines that, you know, by which you should titrate the blood pressure. And of course, an annual screening of ECG and also echocardiography if needed should be done to rule out any comorbid conditions coexisting. What are the drugs that you can use? We know that to reduce cardiovascular mortality, you can go with ACEI, ARB, calcium channel blockers and diuretics, but ARB and ACEI are the cornerstone in you know, uh, bringing in cardiac remodeling, especially in diabetic patients. That is very, very important. And patients with hypertension were not meeting the targets on all the three classes, as you call them, resistant hypertension. And those, th that category of patients can also be added a mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist therapy. So you can add a spironolactone to this patient as their fourth molecule. And this is again something which you get in your daily practice. Three molecules unable to maintain, you need to add a fourth drug. That's where you would use a spironolactone or as in case of resistant hypertension. Quick look at the neuropathy in type 2 diabetes patient. We know it's a diabetes, it's a diagnosis of exclusion. You know, other causes should always be ruled out. This is very important, actually. You know, patient with diabetic patient may have neuropathy because of other causes. So you must always rule out those other causes first. If necessary, get an NCV done of both the lower limbs to see if there is any nerve entrapment which is contributing to the neuropathy. And then finalize that, yes, this is a pure case of diabetic neuropathy. Up to 50% of diabetic neuropathy may be asymptomatic. That is very, very important because the early symptoms will include small fibers, which causes pain and dysthesias, tingling and burning sensation. The larger fiber will cause numbness and loss of protective sensation. And once there is a there is loss or loss of protective sensation, that's when the patient will have a more risk of developing a neuro ischemic ulcers on their feet. So the following tests are used to assess the small fibers. As I said earlier, that the small fiber function you will look at through the pin prick and temperature sensation, the large fiber function will be looked at by vibration and the 10 gram monofilament. The protective sensation you will look at by the 10 gram monofilament test, which is very essential and simple bedside test to perform. Uh, and uh, as I said, that uh, most of the patients would be asymptomatic and when they complain of symptoms, remember it's a never ending complaint because the, every time the patient walks into your clinic, the patient will complain categorically, I'm having pain, numbness and burning, pain, numbness and burning. That is going to become their chief complaint. They will forget everything else and they will keep on complaining that thing every time they walk into your clinic. So it's very important that you diagnose the neuropathy before they become symptomatic. Some of the examination parameters about how to look at the skin, you look at color, thickness, dryness, cracking of the skin, sweating, look for infection, especially the toes and the interdigital spaces. You look for ulceration, calluses, blistering. Uh, more important, you, exam you tell the patient to examine themselves at home. You know, Self-examination also helps. And as I said, 10 gram monofilament is a very useful test. Vibration using 128 Hertz tuning fork, pinprick sensation. Then you look at the ankle reflexes and you do a VPT or biothesiometry going ahead. So the musculoskeletal will be deformity example, claw toes, prominent metatarsal heads, charcoal joints, and muscle wasting, guttering between the metatarsals. Remember one very important thing in this case here is, in these patients, if the patient have any bit of uh, you know uh, ulcerations or any bit of toe deformity, then make sure that you examine, you get an x-ray done to look at charcoal joint. This is something, again, which is very commonly missed into clinical practice. Vascular assessment with foot pulses and ankle brachial index. So this is a summary of the diabetic neuropathy, which I've already told to all of you, but just a take-home point again is you can keep a 10-gram monofilament in your clinic to examine for loss of protective sensation. That is very important. 
And also, if time permits, you can go ahead and check the vibration sense using a 128 hertz tuning fork. How do you treat a case of diabetic neuropathy? We'll just take a quick overview because we know there are a lot of drugs which are available, but most of the time in advanced diabetic neuropathy, most of the drugs becomes ineffective. So you most of the time we treat them with pregabalin, gabapentin, and even duloxetin is used. So the non-opioids like tricyclic antidepressants, SSRI, SNRI, and opioids like tramadol are the other drugs which are used to relieve the pain in neuropathy. Amitriptyline should be avoided in patients with urinary retention, congestive heart failure, cardiac arrhythmia, and also in patients with orthostatic hypotension. Maintaining normal levels of potassium may prevent peripheral nerve injury. And overall, an optimization of the glycemic control is very important to prevent the development of autonomic and peripheral neuropathy. Heart failure is very prevalent. As I've already told you all that it coexists with coronary artery disease and it, it, the non-cardiac comorbidities which are associated with uh, heart failure with preserved dejection fraction is diabetes as the first condition, hypertension, sleep apnea, renal disease and pulmonary disease. So it's very important that in our daily practice, we try to assess a patient for heart failure with preserved dejection fraction, which very much coexists in the community. Treatment goals are to alleviate the symptoms and improve the quality of life. In congested patients, obviously diuretics will be your treatment of choice. Screening and treatment of comorbidity is indicated in patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fractions. Effective heart failure interventions are equally beneficial in patients with and without type 2 diabetes. We know there is a molecule called sacubitril valsartan combination, ARNI, which is very effective in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, even if a Bradin has got certain indications. In terms of the anti-diabetic molecules, uh, in patients with heart failure, you can safely use metformin, and we know SGLT inhibitors, especially the EMPA, the dapagliflozine, they have a more cardioprotective role by all the re recent evidences that we have in patients with coexisting heart failure type 2 diabetes patients. Try to keep their target blood pressure below 140 by 80. In younger patients, you can target a blood pressure of below 130 by 80. Next interactive questions to all of you is, which of the following is the most common indication for hospitalization of a patient with CKD? You can take this option. Okay, so the next question is, the common indication for hospitalization of a patient with CKD. There are four options. Please write your options on the chat box. Okay, the uh, end-stage renal disease. We are talking about CKD here. Okay, so there are people that written sepsis. We have a mixed uh, answer for this. Yeah, Let yeah I think the that. answer is mixed. That's why this question has been kept also. But let's see what the answer comes here. But I will go with all of you who said sepsis and electrolyte imbalance as well. Because okay. these are the two most common disturbances which comes in a patient with CKD because obviously sepsis is one of the components that leads to hospitalization. ESRD, of course, hospitalization in ESRD will happen when the patient is uh, got a ESRD and the patient would require is going towards dialysis. So that's a different purview altogether. But sepsis and most of you have also said electrolyte imbalance, which is absolutely correct because in patients with CKD, they may have an impaired potassium level and that might lead to some bit of arrhythmia, some bit of abnormality, or they may have an other electrolyte imbalance leading to hospitalization. So again, these are the points to see here when you're looking at a patient with um, CKD, you must make sure that the patient is not going into any overt infection, which can lead to hospitalization. At the same time, you must look at their electrolytes at a frequent interval, to make sure that all the electrolyte parameters are within normal range. So we come back to our case and now we're going to the end of the discussion. So how the patient finally recovers, of course the patient has to recover and go back home. So this patient eventually gets treated, has heart failure, gets controlled. His AKI is sort of treated conservatively and eventually after removing of the insults, the patient's um, uh, you know, insulting drugs, the patient's uh, creatinine level starts coming down, his EGFR starts improving. 
Uh, that's the good thing about AKI, it's that it's completely reversible uh, uh, to a large amount of, uh, you know, amount of time, it, it gets completely reversible. So, so the creatinine comes down to 1.5. And uh, now, what would be the treatment of this patient at the time of hospital discharge? Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a discharge medication summary, which you, which you all write with us whenever you're discharging a patient. Now, this is what was prescribed to the patient, okay? But what I want all of you to do at the end is, if you want to add any medicine to this, please write it in the chat box and give a reason as to why you want to add it, number one. And number two, uh, if you do not want to keep any of this medicine in your prescription when you're discharging this patient, then please write why you don't want to keep it. So this is an exercise also that all of you can take. What was given to this patient is torsemide 10 milligram once daily as a diuretic to be given, of course, for a certain period of time. Premixed insulin was continued. There's no reason why you would change this premix to any other type of insulin. You can give premixed human insulin. You can give premixed analog insulin. That depends upon a lot of factors, upon the glycemic fluctuation, glycemic variation, cost, whether the patient can bear an analog insulin. Otherwise, human insulins are perfectly fine to go ahead with to keep the patient on some uh, pregabaline, duloxetine, something to tackle the pain. You have to give him something for blood pressure. So amlodipine and enalapril was given here. Now the enalapril was continued. Creatinine is 1.5. Remember that. Amlodipine was also added as a calcium channel blocker. Dapagliflozin was added here. That is a very important drug being added on here because the patient uh, is a long-standing diabetic. So you need an SGLT effect have come, coming in here. And this would also have a cardioprotective role going on, going ahead. And uh, rosuvastatin 5 milligram was added. I would definitely add a methyl cobalamin in this to this patient, which is not written here. If there's anything else that you guys want to add, or you guys want to remove from this, please write it down and also write the reason behind it. Why do you want to add that molecule? What do you want to do to this patient in the discharge when you're leaving this patient and uh, asking them to come back for a follow-up? So we have the discharge chart here. So any kind of medication you want to, you know, delete it from here or you want to add on, please write, and it write the, the reason chart for it. Yeah. And, and with the reason. reason. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can you please give the reason as well? Yeah, PPI, I agree. Uh, somebody has written PPI. Well, uh, the point is, uh, if you were giving this patient uh, antiplatelet, uh, I would definitely say yes to PPI, but just keeping a PPI in every prescription is not mandatory. If the patient is suffering from any sort of dose of gastritis or esophagitis, that makes sense. Stress, to reduce the risk of stress also, you can give a short course of PPI for two to three weeks, but okay. don't give the continuity in the prescription because so then... The have a habit of taking it throughout. Multivitamins? Yes, of course. You would want to rather give a B12. Yes, somebody B12 wrote. Su yes, supplement. You would definitely want to add a B12 to sort of, you know, minimize, uh, you know, help with the neuropathy. You know, um, 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 uh, I think uh, you would also want to uh, sort of choose between uh, ACEI and ARB here because sometimes what happens when you're using ACEI inhibitors at a high normal creatinine, the creatinine level low tends to go up, especially when your co-prescribing is, uh, yeah, that's a good question. I'll come to that. Uh, why metformin is discontinued? So um, uh, you, you could have uh, sort of uh, used an ARB here because you see, I have seen in our clinical practice that it usually um, sort of uh, tends to have an increase in the creatinine level, especially uh, it also, if you're co-prescribing with the, with the SGLTI, the chances of the creatinine level going up is there. But again, there is a margin. You know, you can let the creatinine level uh, go up for uh, go up uh, to a certain uh, uh, level because if your creatinine is say about 1.3, then with the ACEI in the prescription, after a few months, you might have the patient coming back to you with a creatinine of 1.4 or even 1.5. But remember that it's the effect of the ACEI or even to some extent, the um, the, um, uh, uh, the the SGLT being co-prescribed. So ARB might also be another option that that you might want to use. Now let me take each of the questions which one of you have written, and it's good like all of you are kind of cracking your brains into the the discharge summary and suggesting this is the purpose of the exercise. 
uh, why would you not add a metformin? So yes, you can add a metformin, but remember here, uh, you don't want to push metformin when the creatinine levels are around 1.5 and above. So you can keep metformin at around 500 milligram twice a day, up to 1,000 milligrams a day you can use, but you have to keep on monitoring the creatinine. Metformin would definitely be an add-on benefit. So I completely agree with you. You can keep metformin, but definitely not 1,000 milligram BD. That will be too overambitious a dose which the patient was taking earlier. So you can give the patient it in a reduced dose is also uh, has come out of AKI. So metformin will increase the risk of lactic acidosis. So you have to be very, very uh, careful when you are putting this patient on metformin right at discharge. So I think maybe in the follow-up visit, when the patient comes back to you at three months or four months, or even three, four weeks later, you might want to restart metformin. Uh, somebody has written, um, may exclude enalapril because, uh, one minute. AC inhibitor and some sort of effects on the kidney, kidney disease. So that's what I said here, that uh, up to a certain level of creatinine, your AC inhibitor is actually more kidney protective. Let's say up to 1.5. Beyond that, it actually becomes toxic. So you have to use it very judiciously. So rather than ACI, you might want to go ahead with the ARB, which would be a little bit more softer on that. But I mean, you can, you can even use ACI in this condition. I would say it would still be nephroprotective, but you need to keep monitoring the creatinine going ahead. Somebody has asked, why no medicine for foot ulcer? Now, this is my question back to you. Why would you want to give a medicine for foot ulcer? And what medicine would you give for foot ulcer? We have already written daily dressing of the foot ulcer, but uh, practically speaking, you don't want to inadvertently treat the foot ulcer with antibiotics. There's no need of antibiotics if there is no growth in the cultures. The foot ulcer is a non-healing ulcer, so proper dressing and care of the foot ulcer is more important. And to alleviate the pain, you need to give the patient some kind of pregabaling or gabapentine. <laughs>